morning, Haven Church, and happy Easter. In 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's stand and sing and praise God, our risen King.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken.
the tomb of Jesus was empty over 2,000 years ago. And we now have a new life in him and a brighter future for eternity. Imagine what it would be like if we had no more pain or sorrow or worries. No matter what we face in life, we can have peace through our faith in Jesus Christ when we remind ourselves of the gift of heaven. So let's sing this together, Hymn of Heaven.
celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. And uh, on the way, you should have grabbed one of these communion packets. If you didn't get one, uh, there's some in the back. You can go grab uh, one of those now as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And before we do that, I just want to give you a moment to reflect on all that Jesus did and all that Jesus has done in and through the resurrection. And to think of it this way, that we live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that can be off track. And so on the cross, Jesus takes on all the hatred, all the sin, all the malignancy, everything in the world that's bad, that's untrue, and he carries it all to the cross. And through his suffering, death, and resurrection, uh, he pays for it all. And he makes a way and a future and brings hope to each and every one of us. And so I wanna give you just a minute this morning, whatever in your life uh, is off track, whatever in your life 
uh, is hurting or broken, whatever sins are in your life that have led you away from God, that have hurt relationships with others, just take a moment and let's give those to Jesus this morning. Let's do that silently today. Probably the most familiar scripture passage of all time is for God so loved the world he gave his only son so that ever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life so the resurrection is God working through Jesus to give life to you to forgive you to make you his own know that your sins are forgiven in Jesus name this morning I'm going to bless the elements and we'll take them together this morning just as a church family and as a community it was on the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed they took bread when he gave given thanks broke it and gave it to me. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to me. He said, take and drink of it, all of you. It's my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together this morning. Take and eat the body of Christ broken for you. And let's take the wine this morning. Take and drink the blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus keep your heart and mind steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. Please be seated. So I want to share the Easter story with you this morning and then I will teach about it and all the hope that it brings with it. I'm going to read from John's gospel today, and I'm going to pick up in chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, Here's what scripture says. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, And saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside weeping. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lain, one at the head and one at the foot. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that these things that he had said to her. Let me pray for us this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together today to celebrate the resurrection of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's my prayer today that uh, the good news of the resurrection, that you, Lord, are not dead, but that you're alive, would just sink deep into our hearts and into our souls, that we would know that because of the suffering and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that there's forgiveness for us and life and hope for all who believe. And so, Lord, uh, let us be the kind of people who go and tell. So, Lord, now I pray that the words of my mouth, meditation of all of our hearts, will be pleasing to you, the one who's our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. So, so on Easter, we do this little thing, and, and I just love it. Uh, I say Christ is risen, and you say he's risen indeed. Alleluia. So let's try that. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. 
Hallelujah. That was, that was good, mildly encouraging. We'll try one more time. Uh, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. And I just love that. I, I love that. If you want just a, a, a why behind the resurrection and why it's so meaningful and significant, N.T. Wright says this, what makes the resurrection so great is that future hope becomes present reality. Now think about it, like future hope. You know, in Jesus' day, they believed someday people would rise from the dead. They hoped in that. But yet, what do you see in Jesus Christ? There's resurrection right now. And can you imagine how in that moment, just everything just gets turned upside down? I mean, uh, despair is turned upside down. Disappointment, sin, darkness, death. It's all inverted through the resurrection of Jesus Christ because future hope is present right now. It'll carry you through anything, anything. I wanna press on that just a, a little bit harder and just give you a visual illustration of this. Well, one of my favorite things is, I, I don't know if they still do it anymore, but my aunt's church in St. Louis, uh, they used to have a sunrise service. And here's kind of the story of the church, massive church, uh, thousands of people go there. Uh, it's in suburban St. Louis. And so nowadays it's, it's surrounded by uh, homes and by neighbors, but the church is over a hundred years old. So when you build a church like a hundred years ago, you'd build a church and then you build a cemetery out back. And so they still have the cemetery there. And uh, on Easter morning for years and years, they would go out there at 6 a.m., it's dark, and they would all pile into the cemetery for the sunrise service. And just as the sun was rising, uh, they would shout, Christ is risen, and everybody would say, how you make great neighbors. But, but, but think about it. I mean, it is a profound statement. Uh, he's alive. He's alive. And if you ever lost someone who you love and, and you know, you've been by their grave to know that Jesus Christ is future hope present right now, that he's undoing death's greatest blow, sin, darkness, despair. I mean, he's unwinding all those things. Well, well how good is that? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Have you ever heard that statement, it's too good to be true? You ever, it's too good to be true? You know what I think about Easter? The Easter story, when you really look at it, when you really peer deeply in, um, it, it's too good not to be true. It's too good not to be true. And I wanna walk you through that today. And I wanna, I wanna just talk about three things just to frame our understanding of the resurrection, uh, what happened and what it means. And I wanna look at three things. Talk about the problem, talk about the person, and we'll talk about the power. The problem, the person, and the power. And so let me just walk you through um, the, po the problem uh, as it starts. I'll put this up uh, on the screen. So you know the story goes. Uh, they show up to the grave uh, on that morning, and they're looking for Jesus. And if you're a skeptic and, and you don't believe kind of what's happened here, um, maybe people think when they look at the story of the resurrection, hey, it's a scam. It's just made up. It's fiction. It's not true. Uh, have any of you, has anyone ever tried to scam you? Yeah, so I wanna share with you a, a time where I was almost uh, scammed. And so uh, I got this text message on my phone and um, it was a fraud alert. And it said, um, you know, it said, hey, this is from RCU. Did you spend $275 at a hair salon in Minneapolis? <laughs> Think about that. I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. You just can't. And uh, so I'm like, well, no. And it said, uh, if no, push one, text one. So I texted one. And then it took me uh, to a screen that looked just like my RCU login page. And then it said, enter in your username and password. And then I got it. I was too, you know, it was a scam, right? It was a scam. We get scammed so much. I mean, there's so many people trying to take advantage and trying to distort and trying to show us things that are not true. But you know, sometimes we, we wanna look at something that is too good not to be true. So, so sometimes we just wanna hang on to something that is so good that maybe it's true. So, so let me just ask you this. There's a guy named Tim Keller and he says, you know, just, just imagine this, like you got a letter in the mail and it's not from Nigeria, but it's from like a law firm in Medford. And it looks legit and it looks true. And it says, hey, you know, I know this sounds really odd, but you really do have a long lost uncle. 
and your long lost uncle uh, decided to leave you millions of dollars, would you at least Google to see if the law firm exists? I mean, how many of you are like, I would at least look into it? How many of you are like, not a chance? <laughs> yeah, you know, but don't you want it to be true? I mean, think about this, you know, if you're a skeptic and, and you know, you don't believe in the resurrection and, you know, you're here for whatever reason, maybe, maybe Easter is just a social thing that you do. Um, just think deep down, don't you want on some level this story to be true? That there was this man named Jesus Christ who lived a sinless life, who came to heal the sick and restore sight to the blind and forgive people, and he was crucified. Um, and don't you want it to be true that he rose again? I mean, it's a great story, see? So let me walk you through um, what happens, and we'll just kind of look at the evidence here. And, and so here's what happens. You remember, the, the women went to the tomb first. They're not expecting Jesus to be risen from the dead. Uh, they go there to anoint the body, and, and they show up at the tomb, and he's not there. And so they're just as shocked as kind of any of us would be. And so we'll walk through uh, some of the evidence together. And uh, Peter, and that's actually John who shows up as well, uh, they go there and they start looking at the evidence as well. And sometimes people will say, oh, you know what, back then those people, they just weren't as sharp as we were, as we are. Like they were just filled with superstition and, uh, you know, they weren't really good at verifying things. And, um, you know, uh, of course they just got caught up in this myth of a resurrection. Well, there's a theologian named N.T. Wright. And he says, actually, that's untrue. He said, if you read any document from that age, uh, all kinds of people, plenty of the younger, other folks, they all said, hey, a, a resurrection doesn't happen. They knew there was a resuscitation or resurrection. They knew that dead people didn't rise uh, again. In fact, uh, he calls it chronological snobbery, the idea that we're just so much smarter than anybody who ever came before us. In fact, the Bible, like, even shows just how wise these people were in Scripture, like Joseph, right? The reason Joseph wanted to divorce Mary is not because he didn't know where babies came from, but because he did. I mean, he knew, right? They knew all these kinds of things. And so they got to the tomb, maybe like some of us get to the tomb, just wondering what happened. And so here's what happens. Let's look at the evidence. It said, uh, and stooping to look in, he, John, saw the linen cloth lying there, and he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. It's interesting that word saw there. It's not the normal Greek word for saw, but it actually means like weighing things out, reasoning, looking at what's there. And so what'd they see when they got to the tomb? Well, there was a Roman garrison stationed outside the tomb. They would never have left the tomb. On pain of death, those soldiers knew they would have faced execution if they would have left the tomb, but they're all gone. See a massive stone in front of the tomb, and uh, the stone is rolled away, and no explanation of how it's gone. They think, oh my goodness, you know, if grave robbers were here, why would they have undressed the grave clothes that were on Jesus and just carried Jesus out naked? All his clothes are here, and they're nicely ordered and neatly stacked. Others would say, well, the disciples no doubt would not have stolen Jesus like this because they would not have taken off Jesus' grave clothes, laid them in the grave and carried him naked. It would have been disgrace and humiliation. They would never have done these things. So they go to the tomb and they're filled with awe and wonder because they're like, he's not here. And it takes them back for a second, right? You know, it's so interesting. If you look at all the evidence for the resurrection, and I would just encourage you to do that, you know, read the stories, listen to the accounts. It is too good not to be true. It's the most verifiable, historically accurate event the world has ever known or witnessed, that he was not in the grave. But you know what else kind of shows that it's so legitimately wonderful and so incredibly true? Look at how it changed the lives of everyone who encountered the risen Jesus. They were never the same again, not, not a single one of them. I mean, think about it. They, uh, they died a martyr's death, almost every one of those early disciples. All those who encountered Jesus who was risen never denied it, never changed their story, not once. C.S. Lewis says this, I think it's absolutely true. He says, uh, the truth is like a lion. You know when you encounter something that's true. It's like truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. You just let it out. You just let it out. I like that idea, right? When Jesus comes out of the grave, he really came out of the grave. That's why they never deny it, never change their story. I shared this last year, but I'm just always so moved by, by Chuck Colson's uh, explanation of Jesus and the resurrection. And uh, do you all know the name Chuck Colson? He's involved in something called Watergate. He was part of the Nixon administration, part of this huge uh, attempt to cover up what Nixon had done, what he was probably going to be impeached for. 
And uh, Chuck Colson says this, and it always resonated with me. He went to prison for what he did. And scripture, not scripture, anybody paying attention? But Chuck Colson, <laughs> Chuck Colson said this, um, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 11 men testified they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 11 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 11 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Why? They just know something that's true, and they couldn't turn away from it. I would just encourage you to do this. You know, wherever you're at with Christianity, just just lean into that story. Read the accounts of the resurrection. Read about the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. Just just let it work on your heart and see where it leads you. I think it'll lead you to the same place it led Chuck Colson to say, this is the most incredible true story I've ever heard. In fact, it's too good not to be true. Not to be true. Let let me just push this a little bit deeper and just walk you through uh, what happens next. So uh, Jesus uh, appears or shows up to Mary. So we'll just jump ahead here for a second. It says this, Mary stood outside weeping, and as she wept, she stood and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. So just do this with me. Just just think through this for a second. Because I think it's such a compelling reason why the story is true. She goes there, not first looking for the resurrected Jesus, but she goes there and she doesn't find him. So just imagine for a second, uh, you as just a normal, rational person, you show up at the tomb and uh, you're just filled with what? I think her emotions probably anxiety, right? Where is he? What happened? Who took him? What's going on? And you're in the grips of that uh, for a minute. And then um, I just want you to kind of imagine this next part. Let me jump ahead here and show you what happens next. So it says this, having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, all right, so just imagine this. What do you got to do? Imagine if that's closing your eyes or, or whatever. Just imagine this. Like, like you are at the tomb. And this man who you've loved and followed, uh, who's a teacher and a friend, he's not there. And imagine just like the turmoil and the anxiety you face in that moment, not knowing what's going on or what's happening. And then uh, you can open your eyes. Just imagine the story. So you look over to the side and you see this person. You're like, well, it can't be Jesus. It has to be the gardener because uh, people don't rise from the dead. And all of a sudden, uh, this gardener does what? Well, he starts to ask you questions. So one person asks, you know, why doesn't Jesus just say, hey, it's me? It's because he's the great counselor. And have you noticed this? Like, the best journeys you go on are those journeys of self-discovery where like the questions are pulled out of you, right? But where you say for yourself, oh my goodness, I've discovered who this is. And then look at what Jesus does. I mean, he personally calls her by name. That's just profound. Do you think this is a great story? Just say yes. Yes. You know what makes it even a better story? It's true. You know what makes it an even better story than that? It's your story. This is your story. Jesus, dead in the grave, rose. He's not in there anymore. Sins are forgiven. Life, hope, all for you. He rose from the grave for you. I mean, that's what makes it such a great story. It's too good not to be true. He did all these things for you so you can have life and forgiveness in his name. But you know what? Not only is it a great story, but it's a powerful story. It's powerful. I want to walk you through this just a a little bit as we pull things uh, together today. But let me walk you through um, what happens next. So Jesus looks and he says, 
don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended to my father. Um, but do what? Go, go tell, tell people, go tell people, go tell my brothers. Say that I'm ascending to the Father, to my God and yours. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I, I've seen the Lord. And he said these things to her. There's such great life-changing power in and through the person of Jesus. And um, he's still speaking to people today. He's still doing things today. And uh, you're here on Easter Sunday in no small part because he's spoken to you. And he's led you to him, and he wants you to know him, and he wants you to know everything that he has to offer to you. How does he do that? How do you feel and see uh, the power of Jesus today? Well, let me just give you two things to reflect on. Uh, One, a a couple weeks ago, one of our members uh, shared his testimony to our middle school students. And uh, it really struck me that it's such a powerful testimony to the power of God for salvation in the life of believers. And he said this, that he was um, at Hazleton. He's in Hazleton and he's going through detox and sharing this with our, our middle school kids. And, you know, as things are just unraveling there and dealing with all of that, um, he's in a secure wing, so you can't just leave. And he, he gets up and he just can't take it anymore. So he goes to the door and door to room is open. He walks out of his room and he meets someone there. And, and you know, he, he's just completely uh, uh, unwinding. And this person says to him, well, have you gone to the chapel? And uh, said no. So he walked down, went to the chapel. Chapel door was open, walked into the chapel, uh, prayed to God, and pretty much prayed like he'd never prayed before. And I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but um, just in that moment, had a, a radical encounter with Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, right? You know, uh, uh, taking away uh, his suffering in that moment and just convincing him that, that God is real and that. He's risen and forgiving and all these kinds of things wrapped up uh, in that moment. Well, I think the most interesting part of the story is that he did that at night, late at night. Years later, he went back there and he said uh, to somebody, hey, you know, I had this experience here to one of the workers and um, I got up late at night, I went to my door and I walked out of my door and then I walked down to the chapel and you know, it's maybe 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And the worker's like, well, no, you didn't. So, said, because we lock those rooms every night. There's no way you got out of your room. And he said, well, I did. And then I walked down to the chapel. He goes, well, there's no way you went to the chapel because uh, that chapel's locked every night at 9 o'clock. There's no way any of this happened. But it did. Well, I like that story. I like it because it shows the same God who rose from the dead has resurrection power for you, forgiveness, life, hope, a future. Well, what do you do with all that? What do you do with it? I love how John's gospel ends. Let me just put this up here and I'll walk you through it. Um, let's just say this out loud. I love this text. We'll just say this out loud and we'll talk about it for a minute. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, uh, words for you, statements for you. Jesus is alive. He, he's risen. You're forgiven. Uh, you're in because of Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Well, if you believe all that, then, then what do you do? Well, you go and tell. You go and tell. And I want to just wrap up with this. I'm, I'm reading this book right now. Uh, someone let me borrow it. And uh, I thought it was just a great book. I don't know if you, have you ever read this, Letters uh, from a Skeptic? You ever just read Letters from a Skeptic? just a great book and so i'll give you the context it's by a guy named greg boyd and uh he's a pastor at uh, uh wooddale church in the cities and uh what he did is in about 1990 he started having this conversations with his dad just letters it's back before email it's like you had to actually like like write this thing out and put it in an envelope put something called a stamp and send it somewhere um and, and he did that and uh, he asked his dad he's like hey dad can we have a serious conversation about jesus and his dad's like, oh, absolutely. And you might think, you know, there'd be some tension there. And uh, uh, here's the thing. Um, his dad was not a believer, obviously. Started uh, in 1989. Over three years, they sent letters back and forth, back and forth. And uh, the thing that I find really interesting about this is, is that these are some of the most, like, congenial, civil, compassionate, gracious letters. And yet he's writing with the absolute conviction that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. 
But here's one thing he says, and this just really resonated with me. Uh, just listen to these words for a second. He said, let me first respond to your concern, Dad, that I'm growing tired of your skepticism. He said, perish the thought. I admire the strength of your character and the astuteness of your questions and objections. I'm loving this. Beyond my love for the subject, I'm just enjoying dialoguing with you about the most important thing in life. We've never talked like this before, but I also know something, Dad, you don't. And this also fuels my fire. See, Dad, you're a marked man. God's got your number. He's passionately in love with you and wants you with him through eternity. And in spite of all these issues with his program, which you have in your mind, he knows that your heart is pliable. My job is simply to have the intellectual issues cleared up as much as possible so he can have free access to your heart. I think he's, I think he's getting that more and more with each letter. Well, you know uh, what the bottom line is? is that Jesus Christ suffered, died, and rose again. He did that to forgive you and forgive me. We have such a great opportunity the days ahead of us. You know, if this is your first day here or your 300th day here, you know, as we're building this new church on the south side, people are going to walk by and they're going to say, hey, what's all that dirt out there for? Uh, they're going to say, you know, why are you building that building and, and, and what's it all about? And you can say, hey, I want you to know. You can tell them a little secret. It's not really about the building. It's about Jesus Christ who was dead and now he's alive. And man, everyone is welcome to hear about that. He wants everybody to know. You know what you do if you believe? You go and tell. Let's stand and pray. Stand and pray. Lord, you are so much greater than anything we could ever hope or imagine. Lord, what great news that uh, as scripture said, you were crucified, died, and, was bar and were buried. But on the third day, you rose again. The greatest historical event the world has ever known. And that, Lord, you did that so there could be access to the Father. There could be hope. Lord, let us realize that hope isn't always in the future, but hope is right now. You are the first of what is to come. That someday, every grave will open. And everyone will rise before you. And what an awesome thing that for those who believe in you, there's life and hope in the future. Lord, just let that be wind in our sails. Let us have wonderful and beautiful conversations with people about Jesus. Lord, today, no doubt there are things that we want to lift up to you. We lift up uh, just the suffering and brokenness we see in the world. So many who recently have lost loved ones. Lord, remind us today that just as you rose from the dead, uh, that they will rise too, that you have the last word. So Lord, speak that in a powerful and prophetic way. Lord, for the closes of, closing of businesses in town, for Sacred Heart Hospital, Purveya, others, um, for so many people affected by that, Lord, move in a mighty way uh, to plot out a good future for all of us. We trust you, Lord. We trust you with the needs of our community now and in the days ahead. Lord, for our churches, we build a building. Let it uh, not just be about a building, let it be about an anchor and a handhold for hope in Jesus and knowing that uh, hope is a present reality available to all through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, also on Easter, no doubt there are many things in our hearts and minds. I just want to pray particularly today, Lord, for people who we love and care for um, who, who don't know you. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, direct us to those individuals and that we could just have great conversations, honest and open inquiry, and that it would be fruitful calm and good, but that also, Lord, that you would work in a mighty way through the power of your spirit to lead people to you. All these things we pray in the precious name of Jesus, and now we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just a few things to share before you go. Uh, if you're new here, we're so glad that you're here. 
and we have uh, an opportunity for you. If you want to join our email list, you can do that in the back of church today. We'll let you know the things that are happening here in the days ahead. We also have a gift uh, for you as well, and uh, would just love for you to, to sign up. And you are welcome. You're invited. We, we'd love to have you here, and we need help building the church. So you can go out there and hammer and dig and all those things. Some of you think I'm joking, but a lot of you know I'm not. And so uh, we would really love to have you. And what a great thing to say you built a church. I mean, how awesome is that? Uh, Second, we have a Next Steps class. If you're like, what's this place all about? Uh, You can find out, and uh, we're actually going to hold that Next Steps class um, on April 7th. So uh, we can give you more information about that, but we'll send out an email. Um, It's actually going to be a little later in the day than what we'd initially had planned. And that is because one thing we'd love for you to do Um, whether you've been here for a while or you're new, uh, you're invited. And if you look um, behind the black walls, you can't see it now, there's a bunch of rocks uh, on a table. And what we'd love for you to do is um, to take a Sharpie and write a scripture on one of those rocks, just a verse that's meaningful for you that you think is important uh, in your life. And then um, on the other side of that rock, you can write someone's name for someone who uh, maybe doesn't know the Lord, you want them to or uh, whatever you think would be significant and important for you to have on that rock. And then uh, carry this in mind as you do that. Next Sunday, we're going to go and we're going to take those rocks uh, after worship, and we're going to head over to uh, the building, and we're going to put those rocks down where the, uh, the, the uh, slab of the building is going to be poured. And so the reason we're going to do that so soon is because that slab will be poured, obviously, Uh, Not this week, but the next week. So if you write on a rock, you can either take it with you. You can write something on and leave it here. Um, uh, People have an opportunity to do that next week. If you can't uh, be here next week, you just leave that here. We'll take it, and we'll go throw it in. But the idea is this, that that we want everything we do to be on the foundation of the Word of God and on the story of Jesus Christ saving people. And uh, we want to give everybody an opportunity to do that. And then, uh, you know, if you're there on that day, you can be like, hey, I know where my uh, rock is. So... uh, Something kind of cool uh, to do with that. We're so glad you're here. I, I pray that God will just give you an incredible Easter as you celebrate. There's an opportunity to take some pictures on the back side of that wall. Stop by with your family and uh, uh, get a picture there today. Pray that God will richly bless you. Uh, before we close with singing, just one last thing. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We're going to sing one more song together before... Um, you leave and we wanted you to just know today that that God sees you he cares for you and he is with you so join us as we sing the blessing
for joining us on this Easter Sunday. We invite you to join us next week at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday. So have a wonderful day with friends and family, and we'll see you, we'll see you back next week. <laughs>